All right, welcome back from our little break. I'm going to try and label the lectures as well so they make it easier to upload. Um, so we talked about a little bit about stringology. We talked about what's the point of this class. We talked about all that. Now let's try and formalize a model of computation, a theoretical model of computation, and see if we can, if it's useful, if it's limited, if it's too powerful. We can actually solve problems with it. So I have this, uh, we, let's take inspiration from nature. I have this pet rabbit. It's really ugly. Okay. okay, something like that. That's what it looks like. Um, it has two functions, surprisingly. Uh, barely, it's barely alive. Uh, it does two things. Uh, all it does is it sleeps and it eats. Okay, it's all the only thing it knows how to do. Her name is Nuni, uh, and it seems to go between these two states of being, but depending upon input. So again, we're trying to come up with a model of a computation with a computer. So we'll let's start, of course, uh, observing the natural world around us. So we're going to start with uh, this rabbit. So the formalization here is we're going to begin with two states. One is for sleeping, and one is for eating. These are the only two brain cells it has, and they take turns. So, And it goes between the two brain cells depending upon input received through the eyes or whatever. Um, so if it's asleep, and you wave a carrot or a piece of leaf or something or carpet or phone cable in front of the rabbit, it will transition from sleeping into eating, right, based upon this input. So I'm going to represent this like this as a transition, as an arrow. And I'll call this, I'll put a carrot here, right? So it goes from sleeping to eating when it sees a carrot. And when it's done with the carrot, when it stops seeing the carrot, uh, it goes back to sleep because there's no, no more carrots to eat. It's done, right? So with no carrot, it goes to sleep. Um, what happens if it's eating? What should happen if the rabbit is eating and you give it another carrot while well, it's already eating a carrot? It should keep eating the carrot. So it should. the brain cell should not switch to the sleeping brain cell. It should remain upon input of more carrots it should remain in the sleep, in the eating state of mind. So I'm going to represent this with a self-transition like this. And similarly, for sleeping, uh, if the rabbit still doesn't have any carrots, it's not going to wake up. So we do the same thing here. So depending upon the input of the carrot, transitions it between the systems. Uh, here. This is uh, kind of an idea of how we can formalize a model of computation using uh, this kind of inspiration. It goes between a finitely many states of being, and it can go between those states based on its own input in a very primitive and trivial way, where it just sees what it, and then it acts, very basically. It has no memory of how many carrots it saw in the past or whatever, but that might be okay. So. Uh, if you recall, we did, uh, our first language was what? L1. W is in sigma star, and W begins with an A. So let's try and see if we can build such a system. There's a name for this. It's called a deterministic finite automaton. We'll, we'll do it a little bit more thoroughly in a second. So let's try and build something uh, that can, a, a deterministic finite automaton for this language. So somehow we need to decide what it means for the automaton to say yes and no. We need to determine when the automaton starts and so on. So let's just suppose it starts somewhere. Let's just suppose it starts here. That's the start. Somehow it starts there. Um, now, the way we're going to formalize our automaton is it's going to read the string from left to right. 
and it's going to follow certain transitions as it sees uh, the thing, as it sees the letters, right? So here, for example, uh, let's suppose you started at sleeping, and you see carrot, carrot, no carrot. Then because the last thing you saw was no carrot, you ended on sleeping. So at that moment, the, the rabbit would be sleeping. Similarly here, we want to accept the strings that begin with an A and reject the strings that don't begin with an A. So we want to build an automaton that will correctly decide that language for us. How are we going to do that? Well, it only really matters on the first character. So what we're going to do is just sort of, as we're looping over the string, just conditionally go to different states of mind, whether or not the first character is what we want it to be or not what we want it to be. Make sense? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make two transitions like this to two different states. Then I'm going to say this one's the A transition, and this one is the B transition. So now we've gone to two different states. Yes? The empty string would be here. So it just doesn't run? We start here, and for each letter, we perform one transition. We'll formalize this very thoroughly. Uh, we perform one transition. So if the string is empty, we perform no, trans no transitions. So, so we start and end ends here. Where it starts. Okay. Yeah. So uh, we want this to be the good one and this to be the bad one, right? So we're gonna make we're gonna use a double circle to denote good. A double circle means that that is the good state and this is the bad state. There is a slight problem here. What happens if you run this automaton on a word longer than length one? Well, then it just stops. Oh, it doesn't work because after it reaches the state, it doesn't transition. From yeah, it needs to go. Every transition has to be defined, even if it's trivially defined. So what we 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 do this. What that means is, uh, this is a self loop whether or not we see an A or a B. So you see, if you first you see a B, these are basically two hells, okay? It's purgatories or trash cans or whatever. Whether or not you go to the good hell or the bad hell depends on the first letter you saw. But once you're in there, you're stuck there forever and you can't leave. But there are, the distinction, of course, is arbitrary. This is the one we denote as the good <laughs> hell, this is the bad hell. Can't leave, doesn't matter. But any symbols that come after the first letter are basically discarded. You use the symbols to switch between states of mind. A self loop basically means you can't leave. You're stuck in this state of mind forever. No matter what comes next, it doesn't matter. You only arrive at this state, by the way, if you saw B as your first letter. So any string that ends on this state means that that string uh, began with a B. That's what this means. This is a deterministic finite automaton. And would you agree that this correctly decides the language of L1? So run it on every string. Any string you run it on. We say the string accepts if it ends on the accept state. The one with the double circle, the good state. This state, uh, of course, any string that lands on this state has to begin with an A. So it's the good strings. All the bad strings are on these two states. So this is the good. This is how we've, our decision problem separates the good from the bad. So this is, an, a, a, uh, this is called a DFA. And it stands for deterministic finite automaton. The finite is important. The model of the, com the computer, we're asking a lot of a computer, by the way. Okay, A computer is finite. In description, in size, and everything, every program you've ever written is finite. You maybe not even thought about it. However, you can run the program on infinitely many inputs. You can't actually run the program. You'll die before you try it, but you could in theory, right? There's infinitely many strings. Uh, there's as many strings as there are numbers, so there's got to be infinitely many of them. You can run this string on infinitely many inputs. You can run this computer on infinitely many inputs. So you're asking it to process like infinitely mu much information, even though it's only finitely sized. You're kind of asking a lot of it. In some sense, this whole class is, is the study of, of how to process the infinite with using finite structures. So this structure is finite. However, it can determine uh, something about an infinite set. So it, this, this is a DFA. It separates the good from the bad. Right? 
Any questions before I give you a formal definition and I get very, real vigorous with this? So a DFA, uh, uh, has the following parts. Q, uh, Q0, sigma, delta, and F. It should be capital F. Each of these are parts of the DFA. This is a formal definition. A DFA really is just a picture you draw, but we need to give a formal definition so we can give a definition of, of, of its comp uh, computing ability. So Q is going to be the set of states. So we're going to call them Q0 to QK. This is just some set of states. And it's a finite. It's important that the computer has finitely many states. That's, this, that's the character of this computer. There's finitely many circles, and it can go between those circles. Uh, then we have Q0, which is just a special state, which is just a start state. So it's special. And we denote the start state by this little arrow coming in from nothing. This means it's the start state. We'll also sometimes just write Q0 here, and just then you know it's a start state. So Q0, start state. Uh, sigma is going to be any finite set, any finite alphabet. So like, I don't know, 0, 1, or AB most commonly, right? Usually it's clear from context what the finite alphabet itself is. Uh, then we're going to have, this is the important part. All the other parts aren't moving. This is, the, this is the really important part. Delta is a function. It's a finite function. It takes a state and a letter, and it maps it to a new state. And it's also well-defined. So every state symbol pair is defined. What that means is if you're at any state and you see any symbol, there is a transition. There is something that says, I can go here. Fine. It's just nothing is undefined. Uh, and then F is a selection of the final states. We call these final or accepting states. So this is the formal definition of a DFA. However, you can give all these parts informally, like if I ask you on a homework or something, give a DFA for this language, you can just give me the picture. But the picture implicitly gives all the parts, right? Yes? Um, does it say every state symbol what? Pair. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Basically, it's all defined. There's no like missing transitions or something, right? Everything has to be said. Right. Uh, yes? Sorry, this is my OCD, but that begins with a parenthesis and ends with a curly race. Should it end with a... <laughs> yeah, let's, let's just give, make it a tuple so it ends with a good catch. Thank you. <clears throat> right. Uh, yes, so it's, it's got five parts. Transition function moves between things. Uh, it's got finitely many states, and it just goes between these states uh, to do it. So we mentioned previously this was a DFA for um, L1. Let's see if we can give a DFA for L2. So L2, if you recall, was what? The number of A's was even. Right. Right. So let's take a let's take a moment. I want you guys to try making a DFA uh, on paper. Take a moment, or just think about it, or maybe don't. I can't make you whatever. Uh, so try and draw a diagram that looks like this. Um, that that uh, the good circles. You choose draw some circles. 
Choose some of the circles to be good, some of the circles to be bad. You want the good strings to land on the circles that you like. You want the bad words to land on the circles that you don't like. So let's take a moment, think about drawing a DFA. Maybe give you guys like 60 seconds or something. Oh, I didn't do that. The language, let's say the alphabet is AB. Okay. Yeah. In general, when it's unsaid, the alphabet will always be AB. Um, I'll go ahead. Feel free to keep working on it, but I'll just give you guys the answer. So uh, the way to think about it is like every DFA is like a programming language in this weird sy graphical syntax. So you maybe can bring some of your intuition you have about writing programming languages to do uh, creating DFAs. Every DFA, every string either has an even number of A's or an odd number of A's. So we should think, well, okay, we need at least two states for one for the strings with odd number of A's to end on, and one with uh, even number of A's to end on. And we can go between those two states when we see an A. So let's start with that. We'll have some start state. We always need some start state. We'll call this one Q0. And we need some final state, uh, well, some other state. So we call it Q1. And uh, the empty string uh, is in the language, right? Empty string is in this language we discussed. So it's going, we're going to make the start state also accepting in this case. Then we're going to go between them. If we see, if we do nothing, great. If we see an A though, we've now seen an odd number of A's. So we need to, we need to like leave. We need to leave the final state and go somewhere else. And if we're in this state, this represents that we've seen one A, like an odd number of A's. Then if we see another A, we've now seen two A's. So that's like even. So we need to go back to some final state. So we go here, like this. So if we, this is kind of like a clock, kind of like a, 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 a little doohickey, right? A little gadget that makes sure that the even number of A's always lands on this Q0. But the transition function has to be well-defined. So we need, we need to have, what are we going to do for the B's? Exactly. We're just going to ignore the Bs. Awesome. So that is a DFA. And this one is explicitly non-accepting. This one is explicitly accepting. The way you can quickly tell if a transition is well-defined is that you just check if each state has two outgoing transitions for the size of the alphabet. Yes? Um, so what about, like, so epsilon would be considered the empty string? Yes. So like, do we not deal with like an end to a string, like if there's nothing remaining in the string, or is that ah, like so like death, you have the DFA has to be prepared to end at any moment. Yeah, it doesn't know; it has no idea when the end of the string is coming. Yeah, so like, shouldn't there be a state, like a clearly defined state, or like transition if it ends? It just ends where it ends. It okay, dies so on the just spot. Assume that it just ends where it ends. Yeah, it okay. has to. That's our assumption. So you see nothing, you don't even move. If the empty string, you wouldn't even move. You see a single A, you go here. If, the, if there's no more letters, then you just die there on the spot. You're done. End of the story. You end on Q1. 
Therefore, the, the, this automaton rejects uh, the string containing just a single A, and uh, that would correctly decide the language because that would not be in the language. Right? So this is an example of that one. Um, OK, let's do L3. What was L3 again? Let's take maybe 30 seconds to give a DFA for L3. I think you'll get better at them uh, as you do them. It's pretty fun. It's just drawing pictures uh, kind of uselessly. Wait, is the language just A's? Ah, is that's this. A Here, this, the sigma is going to be AB. The words only contain A's. That's an important feature of this language. The, the alphabet, though, is just AB. So think about what this kind of thing will look like. OK, so it is very similar uh, to L2, actually, if you think about it. So what we're going to do is we're going to have some start states, some other state, Q0. Uh, we want to accept the empty string, right? A, yes. So we're going to make the start state accepting. Uh, we're going to call this one Q, Q1 for whatever reason. And then we see an A, we want to, again, do this kind of clock thing. Now, this will correctly decide languages, correctly decide um, the strings that only contain A's. All the odd length strings of only A's are going to end here and not be accepted. All the even length strings of only A's are going to be here and be accepted. What happens if we see a B? We're supposed to just like break, right? It's just supposed to end on like some state that doesn't get accepted. Right, so we're just going to go to hell. At any moment, you see a B for any reason, into the garbage. Done. Trashed. Yes. Does it matter how many states we like model or? Uh, no. Only finally yeah. many. So, like, all models are the same as long as there's just like a finite amount. Like, we don't need to reduce it to the smallest amount of states. No. That's a great question because it displays your engineering brain. You've every question you've had is an optimization question. You've thought about minimizing something, maximizing something. The fact that we only are concerned with the fact that the DFA even exists. We'll, we'll explain that in deeper detail, but the fact that it exists is sufficient to answer the question we want. Yes? Do we have to make a new state for it to be garbage or can it just... Ah, so how would we, how, you need to be careful with that because suppose you wanted to try only doing it with two states. It's okay to have more states. Like, it's useful. It's like having more lines of code, right? Maybe it's clearer to understand what's going on. Maybe let's suppose we didn't have the garbage can the purgatory. Let's say we went, like, B was here or something. Like, we kept that one. But this would accept A, B, A. A, B, A. Ooh. Right? And that's not A to the N. Something like this, right? So you see a B, you should think, it, like, appeal to the programming part of your brain. Like, I'm just, you see a B, returns exit. You know. Okay, L four. Uh, the number of A's in W is congruent to 3 or 4 mod 7. This is a little bit of a harder one. So try that one out for 30 seconds. Maybe just think about the kind of devices you may need to answer this.
something like this, can't you just set up like seven states? Sure. Like you may states. need one state per yeah, equivalence per class. Uh, yeah, equivalence class. And then you could just go like straight. Back. Yeah, there you go. So we did even. Even is basically what? This mod two. two. So we could do this mod seven. So let's just do exactly what you said. Let's do start state is going to be Q0. Q1. Q2. Q3. Q4. And I'll choose the final states at the end. Q5. Q6, we don't need a Q7 because 7 mod 7 is 0. So Q, each QI is the equivalence class if the number of I's we've seen is mod that, basically. As we see A's, we want to go through our clock. We want to increase the counter. We ins we're using basically each state as like a variable of bounded size. So not a variable that can obviously grow bigger, but we mod the variable by something. So we're going to go through the thing every time we see an A. We see an A, we're in, we've now seen one A, mod 7. We've seen A, we've seen two A's. Right? So if we ever land, if a string ever lands on Q1, it means if it's seen one A, mod 7. It means it's seen an A, or it's seen eight A's, or 15 A's, or something like this, right? You could go around the clock many times, but if you ever land on Q1, you're at the position that, at that point, you've now seen one A, mod seven, right? Uh, now, what happens if we see a B? You just stay. Yeah. Exactly, we're gonna ignore them. OK. Um, now what? Yes. So all of these languages, we're currently defining the uh, DFA that decides for them. And although they're not unique, they can, there's still like, there's a definitive answer. Are we able to do the reverse, take a DFA and find a definitive language that it's deciding for? Ah, great question. So. Every DFA has to decide some language. Mm -hmm. Take any DFA, run every string on it. It's going to sort the good from the bad because a word can't, a word is not going to end on two states at once as we've defined it, right? It's deterministic. Uh, so every DFA defines some language, decides something. But does, is every language decidable by some DFA? That's a very deep, serious and deep question that will take us longer to answer. But maybe just think about that. Let that marinate for a minute. Yes? But if one DFA can define multiple languages, can Ah, no. One language may have multiple DFAs to define it, like how many programs may be semantically equivalent. But every program can only decide one language. Oh, right. right? Because all the states are clearly defined. Yeah. Every DFA, there's no way. Uh, some, some DFA can say yes and no. You do either on the same input. If you run a DFA on the same word twice, it should always say yes. It should always say the same thing. Yes, 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 right? It's unambiguous what the answer is. There's no way, like, by the way, we, we, you couldn't do this, is what I'm saying. Okay. Yeah, That's, yeah. We'll talk about that later. But it's the, deter, the D in deterministic finite automata means that there, that is, that there's, Right, no, I was thinking more like along the lines that different languages could just be like isomorphisms of each other. So then like one, if like they have the same DFA, DFA then... Yeah, so two D if two languages have the same DFA, then they're equivalent. Yeah, that's what yes, I was that's, that is true. Uh, and there are two, maybe two definitions of this, two <laughs> definitions may be equivalent for the same reason. But certainly one DFA can only decide one language. Okay. Yeah, yes. Does a language have to have like a nicely, clearly defined, like, set builder rotation, could you say, okay, this is a language, and it takes this, 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 and, like, these strings here, and then the other strings to the bad state? 
but it's not like an able to be nicely written in a such that way. So for every possible DFA, they decide one language, and there may be uselessly many DFAs, like there are programs, or like as many graphs as there are, there are DFAs, right? right. But uh, here's a way to convert any DFA into a set builder don notation. Just write the set builder notation such that like, it's decided by that DFA, right? right? Kind of ridiculous that would work, right? Like, like um, L question mark, W is in sigma star, uh, like W is accepted by uh, DFA D. And then D is right. defined somewhere in some sense. That's, that's how that would work. Oh, you can just write that? Uh, well, you, this is, he, he, he asked, is every language decidable by a DFA have a nice definition, like a nice set builder notation? Oh, okay. And it turns out only because you can do say this, yes. It may not be nice, to be honest. Some of them, it's not very nice, right? So, um, great questions, though. So here's the here's the last language I'll I'll I'll, I'll give you uh, for the in terms of examples. And what was it? It was it was um, L five. W is in sigma star. Uh, and the int of w, and we'll say 2, is prime. So does there exist a DFA for this? Yes. Is it L4 incomplete? Don't you have to put build states on q 2 q 4 Say it again. Oh, great question. Oh, yes. Thank you so much. I said I was going to decide the final states at the end. So I want, the, I want this final states. I want to accept the strings that are only going to have the number of A's congruent to 3 or 4 mod 7. And because we set, that, set up the states nicely so that the states of, that end in QI are exactly the strings with I, uh, A's, three, uh, mod 7, that means we're just going to have as our final states Q3 and Q4. Great catch. OK. So this language, L5, uh, W's in sigma star. Int W, uh, you can, if you cast the, the word to an integer, it's prime. So what is the characterization, characterization of DFA? What is DFA, really? It's really, they really correspond to a very specific kind of program. One where you take on an input, you can only read it left to right, you cannot go back, you don't know where the end of the input is, and you only have a finite amount of memory. Okay? Think of each state as like a piece of memory. Right? You, can't use, you cannot use unbounded memory in any sense. Yet you are asked to decide infinitely, arbit not excuse me, infinitely, but arbitrarily long words. This DFA has seven states. But it is correct if you ran it on a string of length 1 billion, right? The strings you run it on are far longer than the, than the thing itself. So we're really asking about programs that can take arbitrarily long input, but they themselves are of constant size. The memory used is constant. These correspond kind of to programs of constant size, constant memory use, uh, or even no memory use, right? So could, if there did exist all these languages, the fact that we're able to give DFAs for them also implies that there exists programs that have a very specific character to s decide them. Does such a program exist for L5? Well, I mean, if you can read it right to left instead, maybe, but I doubt. You can't read it right to left to right. You can't read it right to left. So, yeah, you can't. Yes? Question. This isn't, like, really related to anything that's been said, but this is, like, very, very similar to the definition of Alan Turing's Turing machine. We'll talk about that in like a month. Oh, okay. Then I'll just wait a month. Yeah, just wait a month. So Not bad. We'll spend we'll spend like two thirds of the course on that. So we'll come back to you on that one. Um, so in general, are there any languages that you can think of that don't have a DFA? Can you think of something that shouldn't have a DFA? Can you think, let's see if we can come up with an example of something that doesn't have a DFA. <clears throat> I don't know, I don't know, but I don't know how a DFA would show, like, addition of, like, numbers. Yeah. And, like, 
like mathematical things like that? So here we're able to kind of do like modular arithmetic. We couldn't do like unbounded something. Yeah. So it would depend exactly how you formalized it. Um, to give you an example, just to allude to the future, think about this language. Think about um, a to the n, b to the n. n is a number. We'll talk more very rigorously about this language, but basically, as you imagine you're reading it left to right, there shouldn't be a way to read to do this language left to right with constant memory. Right? You need to imagine you're actually trying to decide this language with a program, Python or whatever. You count the number of A's, you count the number of B's. That variable, if you, if you string input one trillion, your variable size is going to be like log a trillion when you count the A's. But that, that's not constant. That's going to grow with the size of the input. Right? So this doesn't seem like, and it's true that there isn't a constant size program to decide this language. So that's, that, we'll get into the intuition on that. So in some sense, the DFA is a very limited kind of computer already. Uh, it's not that powerful. It can't do really anything, it turns out. Uh, we were able to do some kind of really trivial string matching things. It'll also turn out that, if, do you guys know anything about primality testing algorithms? Like, what is an algorithm for, the, for finding prime, if, determining if a number is prime? It, like, what, here's a bad way, is to check all the integers less than it, less than square root of it, to see if it has a factor. Um, Maybe something with Fermat's little whatever. You know, it, the, these kinds of things don't really fit the model of this kind of constant space, linear time thing. The DFA also doesn't know where the end of its input is. It has to somehow be ready to end whenever it, it has to. It can't jump to the end. It can't do any kind of future, anything like this. OK. So, yes. So what you're saying is like any language that requires like previous knowledge of the states, I mean, of the string before, are not able to be modeled by like a DFA? It depends on how much previous knowledge, exactly how much previous knowledge. Oh, well, because if you make it like an infinite amount of exactly. states on A to the N, B to the N, exactly. you can model it. You don't have infinite states. Okay. <laughs> You end on this state, you can mentally think, I end on this state because I've seen two A's. Because I'm coming from this state, and I only got to that state because I had seen one A. So you end at this state, you can think that I'm in the state of mind if I have seen two A's at this point. That's sort of the idea. Two is finitely many, though. Like, you couldn't say I've seen N A's. You could have seen 17 A's. You could have 17 states. No problem. But you can't have an arbit you can't determine I've seen arbitrarily many A's at this point in a way that you'd like store and reuse that to check uh, that you have the exact number of B's at the end. Okay, thank you. Question? Yeah. So for L5, it has to basically say for all natural numbers if a number is prime. Yeah, so anything to has to decide, it has to decide it correctly. Right. It has to be correct on all inputs. Right. It has to correctly say true or false uh, whenever we give it a number, if it's prime or not. We'll or prove there is no DFA for it, but intuitively, maybe you should be able to think there is no DFA. Because there are infinite primes, right? There are infinite, infinitely many strings that begin with an A. Right. So the character, the, the character of this language is harder than the character of the language begins with an A, right. right? So begins with an A seems like an easy problem. Primality does not seem like an easy problem. Yes? Um, like in that example you gave a to the n, b to the n, if n is bounded, it's it's able to be modeled. Sure. Right? Because then you could just list out all the possibilities and then just like map it to Absolutely, it. absolutely. Every finite language has a DFA. Okay. Let's give suppose we have the language A B B A. We see an A, we see a B, we're good, uh, unless we see something else. If we see a B, we see an A, we're good, unless we see something else. I think that's right. 
Yeah, so like something like that where you can just like map out all the possibilities, right? Yeah. But since it's not bounded, then it's impossible. Right. Okay. Any finite language is regular. We really don't care about the finite. Oh, I didn't say I didn't define regular yet. But every finite language has a DFA. Uh, we don't really care about the finite languages, though. We really care about the finite structure being able to process infinite data. Finite structure processing finite information is trivial. Uh, we care about uh, you know like going back to our roots with the rabbit. You give the, the, the rabbit infinite carrots. I mean, that's a much more interesting carrot uh, uh, question than if we gave it you know one carrot or something, right? So, all right. I think I have time for one more uh, thing. Oh. So obviously, every DFA kind of corresponds to a program of uh, finite space, like that uses n not that much space. So what about two programs? So like, if you have two programs of finite space, two times the finite number is still a finite number, right? So if you have two uh, DFAs, you should be able to build one DFA to do both things at once. Only because you can build a program that uses constant space, you can merge two programs that use constant space to, use one, to be one program that which uses still constant space. Intuitively, so we're going to do exactly that. We're going to sh I'm going to simulate. We're going to make one DFA, which is capable of running two DFAs simultaneously. It's going to. It's going to. One DFA is going to simulate two DFAs. So suppose we had. Um, suppose we had. Uh, uh, DFA like a D1, and it was some states Q1, sigma, uh, Q, we'll say 0, 1, uh, delta 1, and F1, and we had like DFA D2. Let's say Q2 sigma. We'll just give them the same alphabet to be make things easier, but it generalizes past that. Uh, Q02, delta 2, and F2. We uh, build uh, DFA D to be D1 and D2 simultaneously. So all we're going to do is um, quite literally do the Cartesian product of these two DFAs in a graph sense. So D is going to be like this. Uh, Q is going to be Q1 times Q2. For every state, we're going to create a pair of states. Uh, sigma is going to be the same. Uh, Q0 is going to be the state corresponding to the start states of both of those. 0, 1, Q, 0, 2. Um, delta 1, delta is going to be, well, if we're at two states simultaneously, we want to go with both of them at the same time. So what we're going to do is just take the Cartesian product of those transition functions as well. So if we're at, like, some QI... Qj, and we see symbol A, we're going to go from Qi, Qj to as if we were going from Qi to whatever, as if we were going from Qj to whatever. And then we'll go to some specific thing. So this is going to be some state that's going to be delta 1, Qi, A, um, delta 2, Q, J, A. And then finally, our final states are just going to be as if we were in the final states of both of them. Right. So again, uh, this is just a definition. 
but it's going to make more sense when we do an example. So let's do uh, L. Uh, I'll just call them L1, even though we already called something that. W is a word. And uh, uh, W ends with a B. So what would this DFA look like if it ends with a B? So we're at some state. If we see an A, we can ignore it. But as soon as we see a B, we're ready to go. But then if we see an A, we need to like not be ready to go, because we need to be prepared to end at any moment. So I'll go back with an A. And if we're here and we see a B, great. We'll just continue to be there with a B. So let's agree that that DFA does decide uh, that language. right? No qualms about that one. I'll label these states. I'll label this Q0, and I'll label this Q1. L2 is going to be a wor the words such that uh, the number of Bs uh, is even. We did a similar example with the number of A's. So um, we're going to do a little clock. And we're just going to ignore the A's. And uh, the start state is going to be this one. And even because I call this one Q1 and Q0, Q1, I'm going to call this one Q2 and Q3. Uh, is that right? And we all agree that this DFA correctly decides this language? Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Um, so what's our Cartesian product going to look like? I'll do it here. I have enough room, I think. I'm going to make, well, I need the states. The states are going to be one state per pair of states. So the number of states is going to be the number of states here. I was really good by choosing two states, two DFAs, each of size two, so there's only going to be four states. Had I chosen one DFA of size four, one DFA say of size like three, still reasonably small, I would have 12 states. It's a crazy amount. I'm going to have these four states. Now, uh, we'll call this one 0, uh, 2. We'll call this 1. We'll call this 0, 3. We'll call this 1, 2. And we'll call this 1, 3. So now there exists a pair, uh, a state for every pair of states. I'm just kind of writing a little bigger so I don't have to do the cube. Now, what is the start state? Yes, the start state is going to be the state corresponding to the pair of states here. Each state corresponds to being in a pair of states here. So if you're in 0, 2, that means you're in this DFA simultaneously in states 0, Q0, and in state Q2 at the same time. So we're running two DFAs, simulating two DFAs on one big DFA, what this construction is. Um, now what happens, uh, let's do our transitions. This is really the hard part. All the other part doesn't matter, is the transitions. What happens if you're in zero, to, yes? Can you circle the one, like the acceptance state? Or can we do that first? Sorry. Sure. Uh, like so what is the accepting state? Is it, is it just like one, two? Because yeah. Both of them are circled? Ah, are both of them circled? Yeah, there's like a circle in Q1 and Q2. So yes. So the cross product of two would just be the acceptance state. Yes. So if they're like multiple acceptance states, then you just find like the Qs that like match up. And exactly. It's, okay. it's the Cartesian product of the final state. Okay. Yeah. OK, so what happens if you're at 0, 2? What happens if you're at 0, 2 and you see an A? It should be what happens if you, if you were at 0 and you saw an A, and if you were at 2 and you saw an A. So if you're at 0 and you see an A, you go back to 0. If you're at 2 and you see an A, you go back to 2. So if you're simulating both at the same time, you'd be from 0 to 0 and 2 to 2. So you go from 0, 2 to 0, 2. Now what happens if you're at 0, 2 and you see a B? 
Well, if you're at zero, you see a B, you go to one. If you're at two, you see a B, you go to three. So you go to one, three, if you see a B. Does that make sense? Any questions on that one? OK. If you're at, so we've done this one. Remember, each one's going to have only two outgoing transitions. If you're at 0, 3, you see a A. Let's say you're at 0, 3, you're going to go to 0, 3. So you're going to go to 0, 3. If you're at 0, 3 and you see a B, what happens? You're going to go from, if you're at 0, you see a B, you go to Q1. If you're at 3, you see a B, you go to Q2. So you're going to go to 1, 2. From 0, 3 to 1, 2. If you're at 1, 2 and you see a B, if, you, let's say if you're at 1, 2 and you see an A, if you're at 1, 2 and you see an A, you're going to go to 0, 2 if you see an A. If you're at 1, 2 and you see a B, you're going to go to 1, 3. If you're at 1, 3, if you're at 1 and 3 simultaneously, you see an A, you're going to go to 0, 3. If you're at 1, 3 simultaneously, you see a B, you're going to go to 1, 2. Awesome. So this DFA is two DFAs. This DFA simultaneously is two DFAs at the same time. This DFA runs both of those DFAs. What is the language accepted by this DFA? What does this DFA decide? What are the set of strings that this DFA says yes on? If it's even and ends with a, or if the number of Bs is even and it ends with a B. Yes. Exactly. And and, we say, is represented set theoretically what? Close. Intersection. Intersection. So this DFA is going to say yes to the strings that end on, you only get to the final state if you got to the final state on both. That's why it's an intersection. You're only going to end on a final state if you're a final state on both. You can generalize this, though, to get the union. You can change the and to the or. How would you do that? You would do like either it was one of the final states but not the other, maybe. So this would be like q1 times f to union f1 times q2. Something like that, I think. And what you end up with is going to, that would include uh, anything with a 1 or anything with a 2. So this would be accepting. I'm just going to do a dotted so we know it's different. And anything with a, t anything with a 1 or a 2, so this would be accepting. Right, so if you end on, say, 1, 3, what that means is that you run it on the same word. If you ru you're running these two DFAs on the same word. If you run it on uh, 1, 3, if you end on state 1, 3, that means you ended on state 1 and you ended on state 3. So when you only have one, two accepting, you want to accept if both are accepting. That's the and. But if you want to accept if one of them are accepting, you, one is accepting, so you accept in that case. So this is a proof like if, the, like, if uh, two languages have a DFA, then the intersection of those two languages also have a, D, have a DFA. I'm going to leave you with one definition. If a language has a DFA to decide it, we say the language is regular. This is bidirectional? Every, lang every regular language has a DFA. Okay, sorry. It's an if and only if relationship, certainly. So every language, if a language is regular, if you see on a problem or something, let L be a regular language, then there exists a DFA. Pavlovianly, you can just say there exists a DFA because it's regular. Um, we represent this. This is a class of languages. We use this big fancy L for DFA.
So ba this basically means this, this is not a language, but it's a set of languages. So it has some number of languages, and each language in, has a DFA for it. So uh, this is the set of uh, regular languages. This is what we mean. When we say language is regular, we mean there exists a DFA for it. Yes? Can you take the complement of a DFA by just flipping the good states and the bad states? Absolutely. If a DFA can say yes and no, a DFA can also say no and yes. So if you do that and use De Morgan, can you find the or that way? Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is an actual, you can, we'll talk about this extensively, actually. But you can, talk, you can prove a language is regular by not even having to give the DFA, just by using a little bit of logic. But it may be helpful if you wanted to actually show what the DFA is, to do the Cartesian product construction. Great question. Great question. Yeah. Okay, that's it. I love you guys. I'll be around after class. You guys have any questions, anything?